great to be back in your living rooms and we are so excited this morning because Pastor Rowan is bringing us an epic word. But before we get into it, let's go over a few things. Every Thursday we have Alpha happening. So if you want to ask some really big questions or if you want to get to know a little bit more about what Christianity is, then head to our website and sign up for Alpha. We'd love to see you there. We also have lots of different links at our website that can get you connected in. If you have a testimony that you want to share, if you want prayer, or if you want to become part of a community group, then the website is your place to go to find all of those things. So we encourage you to check it out. And in the coming weeks, we have Pastor Arthur, who has been preparing an amazing series about the second coming of Jesus. In that series, he's going to be covering some major topics like prophecy and end times, and it's going to be amazing. So we can't wait to share that with you soon. But for this morning, let's get, get straight into it with Pastor Rowan. Bye. Well, good morning, Wine Press. Uh, my name's Rowan. If you've never met me before, it is... Uh, it is an honour and a privilege, a little bit scary to come and bring the word to you this morning. Uh, so if you've never met me before, I'm one of the generation leaders here at Wine Press. I get to work with some young people and older people and everyone in, in, in the middle. And uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's an honour and a privilege to bring the word to you this morning. I hope God speaks to you. I pray that you get something out of this, especially in these crazy times. Let's start with some prayer. Father, I, I thank you right now that your presence isn't in a building, but that you are a God that is everywhere at all times. So Father, this morning, I believe that you can touch anyone that is looking for a fresh touch from God. Father, I pray that you would meet their needs, whatever their needs may be this morning. But God, I pray that you would be seen. I pray that you would be seen in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, my name's Rowan, and as a generational leader at the Wine Press, uh, one of the questions that I've been consistently asked throughout this crazy time, outside of why are we in this crazy season, is what can I do to serve God? What can I do to serve God? And my answer's been really simple, and that is, why don't you actually take some time? It's a slower pace to what we usually used to, for most of us, why don't you take some time, sit down with God and ask God this question. Am I walking the way you want me to walk with you, God? Am I walking the way you want me to walk with you, God? Because I believe that the main reason we are created, the main call of God on our life is quite simple. It's to reflect God. And it says this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, we will make man in our image so that when people see man, they'll get a reflection of us, the heavenly people, God. And so if you've ever met my son, Reuben, you get a glimpse of his creator in a sense. Reuben is made in my image and to see Reuben is to see me. And Jesus said throughout the Gospels, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. If you've heard my heart, you've heard the heart of the father. So I believe wholeheartedly the greatest call of God on our life is just to reflect our maker. And so I just think it's a great opportunity, people, to uh, just to say, God, am I walking the way that you want me to walk right now? Why is that a great question? Well, because we book our car in for a service at a mechanic. We go to a doctor, we get the doctor to check us out. We go to a chiropractor, we go to, a, you know, we, we go to a physiotherapist and we do all of this to service our body. But we don't often take the time to sit down with God and say, God, am I working the way that you've actually created me to work? You know, I've got a great mechanic. And when I take my car to the mechanic, uh, he often says to me, oh, so you think you're driving a four-wheel drive? I don't drive a four-wheel drive. I drive a little hatch. And uh, what he's telling me is that my car's created for one, um, for, for, to be driven one way but I'm driving it like a Toyota Land Cruiser and my car's not going to survive that. Other times he'll service my car and he'll say, ah, oh, so you're a Formula One car driver. And what he's telling me is that my car, it's not a Formula One car and I need to stop thrashing the engine. In other words, I take my car and I use it in a way that it was never created to be used. My car is not a four-wheel drive. It's not a Formula One car. And I think to ask the question, God, am I walking with you the way that I'm created 
to walk is it's a little bit like looking at my car. Am I driving the car for the way that it was created to? And so often in our life, we go through life with God and we end up doing things that we want to do because it's cool. We end up doing things that we want to do because it might make us sound better. When I first started sharing the gospel, I, w- I wanted to preach like I wanted to preach with a voice that reminded people of Mufasa, Simba. You know, I don't. It's probably a high pitched voice. I'm never going to have that Mufasa moment when I preach. But sometimes, earlier on, I would try and sound like Mufasa, where I'm probably more like a Simba. But there's so many things that even I do because I'm trying to impress people or because I want to be more like those people because I'm not happy with the call of God that's on my life. So this morning, I just want to encourage you. We're going to have a quick look at David and uh, see what David did, see what we can learn from David. So let's jump in to the word. And uh, I'm reading from the book of 1 Samuel 17, verse 38. Let me paint the picture first. David, uh, in the previous chapter, David has been met by Samuel and anointed as the next king. But he's only about 15, 16 years old. A chapter later, we see the whole Israelite army scared to come out and face this one giant. David rocks up to the battle. And David's talking to the king and he's like, why, why are we hiding? You know, my God is amazing. My God is massive. And for the first time in a while, uh, King Saul has a champion. But he looks at David as if to say, come on, little fella. I don't know that you're quite up to it. And David is testifying in verse, sorry, if we go back to verse 34, David says, but Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear or a tiger, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, when they came out to take the lamb from the flock, I went out after it. I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. All of a sudden, King Saul starts to get a little bit of confidence. Hey, we've got our champion. And then in verse 38, I just want you to remember before I read this, David was a what? David was a shepherd. It says this in verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. You know, it's crazy when I I said earlier that sometimes we try and do things in life that God's never called us to do. And And so here's David. Here's a shepherd boy. David has testified of God's goodness, testified of being protected by God's power. And yet he's still letting Saul dress him with Saul's armour. Saul was a tall guy. Saul's armour was created for Saul. David won all his battles as a shepherd with a slingshot. You know, and it says back in the book of Judges that if you were skilled with a slingshot, you could split a hair. You could split a hair. So David knew that when he was going to go out to battle this giant, what he needed was he needed his shoulders to be free, not constricted in something that he'd never worn before. And so it says that David tried to walk in Saul's armour. And then he said, you know what, this isn't me. This doesn't work for me. The point, the first point I want to bring out from this is when we're sitting down with God and going, God, am I walking the way that you want me to walk. One of the greatest things we can remember is that the preparation determines the length of our journey. That how God is preparing us determines the length of our journey. You see, David's preparation was in the field. David's preparation uh, for this battle was when he was fighting the lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, there weren't actually any tigers. That's not biblical. There were lions and there were bears. But his preparation was when he was singing psalms, when he was writing psalms, when he was leading the sheep to water and sitting under a tree and just saying, God, I just want to journal and I just want to sing you a song. That was his preparation. God was preparing David to be the greatest king that Israel had ever seen. 
and his preparation was all in shepherding the sheep. That was his preparation. And we can look at other people and try and speed up this process. And God goes, no, no, Rowan, I just want you to sit in the field and I just want you to shepherd. Preparation will determine the length of our journey. Maybe somewhere along your journey, you've changed the preparation that God's put you in. And you started preparing yourself in ways that other people have been prepared. And if I could call this sermon, if I could give this sermon a title, I'd, I'd say, hey, it's time to get undressed. Uh, I can't say it's time to get nude, but I can say it's time to get undressed. Within context, it's time to take off the things people have put on us, the things that we've put on ourselves. So point number one, preparation determines the length of your journey. Point number two, if you get a chance to sit down with God and just say, hey, God, am I walking the way that you want me to walk? We need to ask God in every season of life, how do you want us to walk in this season? And then say this, now God, you clothe me. Now God, you clothe me. You see, we see in verse 38, the verse starts, I'm reading from the New King James. So Saul clothed David. And we have people in our world that will love us, that will want the best for us. But sometimes they can put their call on us and they're, they're trying to love us as best they can and they don't mean to do us harm. But when I carry something that I'm not created to carry, I will buckle under the weight of that. The best thing I can do for God is to walk the way God has called me to walk because that's where the power is, not walking like someone else is trying to walk. And you see it says, And Saul clothed. David. In other words, Saul took what was his call and he put it on David. And by the grace of God, David said, I can't walk in this. Come on, I can't do this. He tried to walk and he couldn't. So he gets undressed. And maybe in spending some time with God, you'll get to a point where you go, hey, people have tried to put their call on me. I can't do what they do. By the grace of God, I, I work for the wine press. And if Pastor Arthur ever said, Rowan, we're going to give you a new job position. You're going to be head of administration. I would see that uh, as, as Pastor Arthur asking for my resignation. Administration is not my strength. What I do at the wine press, I'm surrounding myself with people that can do administration. Administration is not my call. And it's not my gift. So I get great people around me that can help me and that can do that for me. And when it says, and Saul clothed David, I get a clear picture of me. And I think, well, who's been clothing me? Who have I allowed in my life to clothe me? Has it in every season of my life been God? Or have I allowed other people to place their call on me? Have I allowed myself to get so excited with what I see out there that I want to be like everyone else except Rowan? I may not be the greatest preacher. I may not be the best looking preacher. But I know that I'm called to communicate the Word of God the only way that I can. Can I get better? Absolutely. But in this process of isolation, I've sat with God and I've had to get undressed. I've had to take things off that I've put on me that God never asked me to do. I've had to take off me aspirations that I've desired that God's never placed on my heart. But I've seen something. Like David, I've seen the armour of the king. Imagine for a second if David rocked up in the shepherd's field wearing the armour of Saul. People would laugh at him because he wasn't called to wear that. He was called to be a shepherd. Even on the battlefield, he was called to still be a shepherd. Even when he was anointed as king, he was called to shepherd. He looked pretty crazy walking around the sheep. The Bible says, and he fastened Saul's sword. He'd, he'd look crazy. He can't chase after the sheep. You know, if a sheep disappears, Jesus paints the picture. I'm going to leave the 99 sheep and look for the one. Imagine if David had to do that dressed in King Saul's armour. He couldn't do that. The search wouldn't be long under the weight. It just wouldn't happen. And so David had to get undressed. And David had to go back to what God had dressed in him. So point number one. If you make time for this process, let me encourage you. Preparation will determine the length of your journey. Point number two, 
In every season that we walk through, let it be God that clothes you. And if it's not God that clothes you, you will not find freedom in what you are trying to do. Like I said, David's key weapon was a slingshot, raising his arm with the slingshot and having the armor that would have constricted him. That would have interrupted everything that David was trying to do with his aim, with his, his running, with the speed of how, how quick he was going to whirl that around. You know, one of, the, uh, one of the funniest stories I can think of when we try and be someone uh, that we're not is every Saturday I get up and I put on my, my weekend clothes. And that's a fluorescent polo top and uh, some tradey pants. And at some point, I think the call of God on my life is to go to the local Bunnings store. Now, when you rock up to a Bunnings store dressed like a tradie, people will eventually ask you for assistance if they can't find someone. I remember the first time I did this, people were coming up saying, hey, can I ask you for some help? And I, I just said, you know what, I, I actually, uh, I'm not a tradie. Uh, these hands, they're, they're soft hands, they're not calloused. Uh, I actually have no idea what I'm doing. I just want to look like I do. And so I come to Bunnings, pretty much just to buy a sausage, which you can't get during isolation. But there was one Saturday, someone came up and said, oh, excuse me, sir, can you, can you give me some advice on this tap? And I said, actually, no, I actually don't have any I, I, idea. Um, by the fifth person that came to me and asked me for advice, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to have some fun with this. Someone came up and asked me to help them out with, uh, with some tools. So I just gave them the best advice that I could. And I said to them, hey, you know, when you get that home, don't throw out your receipt. I'm pretty sure I've given you the right spanner. Hold on to your receipt and bring that back. I repented of that. Hopefully that guy got home and he wasn't too angry with me when he realized I actually had no idea. But here's, here's my point. When I get dressed like a tradie, I can even fool myself into thinking that I know what I'm doing. And I can watch the YouTube clips and I can think that I'm amazing with tools. But my wife, who's a theater nurse, begins to worry when I play with power tools that I'm going to end up in her theater because she knows I can dress like a tradie, but it doesn't mean I'm going to work like a tradie. I have the knowledge of a tradie. And that just reminds me, we've got to be careful with what we put on ourselves and what we allow others to put on us. And the Bible says very clearly, and Saul clothed David. Number three, what I want to say is this, that in this time, if you find the time just to say, hey, God, um, God, would you just allow me to sit with you? And uh, God, if I need to get undressed, would you help me to do that and take things off my life? You've got to understand that in your call, the Bible says we've got to run the race with endurance which tells me that at some point God is going to have us in this thing called Christianity. He's going to have us go from a point of where we walk to a point of where we run. And so I love that David says this. David says in verse 39, David fastened his sword, but then he tried to walk for he had not tested them. And it says this, I cannot walk in these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. One of the greatest things about getting undressed from all the expectations that we've put on ourselves that are unjustified and, and picking up other people's calls is that at some point in some in some season, church, God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now I'm calling you to run. And if we do not understand how to walk, God will never ask us to run. Run the race with endurance. And David says here in verse 39, I cannot walk in these. So David took them off. And in verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came near and drew near to David, that David hurried and ran toward the enemy. David was able to run because he got undressed. Because he was wearing something and he said, I can't walk in this. And so he got undressed and he walked and then he was able to run. You know, my little girl, Lucy, she... Uh, She's an amazing young lady. But when she was little, we got told that she was going to need, uh, she was going to need glasses. And so we went to a behavioral, uh, I think it was a behavioral optometrist. And the first, the first thing this young man asked us, my wife and I, was how old was she when she began to walk? Now, Lucy, uh, she walked at a super young age. She pretty much just like out of the womb and she just walked out the door. 
Actually, she wasn't that young. She, uh, she was probably about nine months, eight and a half, nine months, when she was walking around the church and people would walk up to us and go, that's so cute. She's, uh, you know, she looks like a, a, a doll. And I would think, yep, clearly, that's my daughter. She's an overachiever walking before she should. Then the optometrist said this. He said, your daughter walked before she should have been walking. And so the body will take uh, itself through a process where it teaches itself every motor skill that it needs. And so for Lucy, she went from crawling really quick straight into walking. And her, this, this optometrist told us that her body missed a whole training regime and, and that affected her eyes. So my wife and I, we put Lucy into this program. We took her through this program where we had to literally go back through all these very basic motor skills. I say all of that just to paint a picture of that if we can't walk for God, we'll never be called to run. And maybe you're struggling to walk because of the expectations you've placed on yourself. You know, there's a story really quickly. Um, there's, uh, the, there's a young man in a village and he meets Jesus. He says, Jesus, what can I do? And Jesus says, take this rock, hands him a rock. And he says, meet me at the top of the mountain. The young man says, I can do that. I can do that, Jesus. So Jesus says, I'll see you at the top of the mountain. So the young man starts his journey. And he, he walks, he leaves his village and enters another village. And one of his friends walk up and says to him, well, where are you off to? He says, well, I'm carrying my rock to meet Jesus at the top of the mountain. He says, no way. Jesus asked me to do the same thing. Could you perhaps maybe take my rock and save me the trip? The young man wants to be helpful. He says, absolutely. Hand me the rock. So now he's got two rocks and he's walking. He passes through another village. He meets another friend and says, what are you doing? Well, I'm taking this rock and this rock to meet Jesus at the top of the mountain. The second friend says, hey, would you mind taking my rock? You can see where I'm going with this, I'm sure. By the time, Jesus gets, by the time this young man gets to the top of the mountain, Jesus says, what took you so long? The young man says, well, every village I came through, I was asked to carry another rock. And by this time, the young man's not just carrying the rocks. He's got a wheelbarrow full of rocks. And Jesus just looks at him and smiles and says, I never asked you to carry their rocks. I asked you to carry one rock. And that story paints a great picture of how we pick up other things that people should be carrying. And in a sense, dress ourselves with the weight of that. If we don't walk, we can't be called to run. And if the Word of God says we've got to run the race with endurance, that tells me that at some season in our life, God will call us to run. So, if you find time to sit down with God and start to unpack this and undress, remember point number one when you're asking God, am I walking the way that you've called me to walk? Don't be a hurry to bypass the preparation. Remember your preparation determines the length of your journey. Point number two, ask God to dress you in every season. Saul clothed David and David realized very quickly that God had already dressed him and he took off what Saul put on him. And point number three, God has called us to run, but before we run, we need to walk. I just want to encourage you, if you're watching this uh, this morning or it could be evening or whenever you're watching this, I just want to encourage you that God has placed something so precious in us. And isolation has given us uh, a window for a miracle where we can just meet with God and God can do a work in us. Don't be in a hurry to leave isolation because the window for that miracle, whatever God wants to do with us and in us and through us in isolation, that window is getting smaller and smaller. So I ask that you would make time to spend with God. Let me finish with one more story. It's about another village. It's always a village. And in this village, uh, that, this village was surrounded by gold. And they didn't know the value. They didn't understand the value of gold. So they would mine the gold. And then one day the chief said, let us make a monument in the middle of the village just because we've got all this gold. So they did. They made a massive statue. And then one day they heard that, that an opposing village found value in their statue. And they were sending people to come and steal their statue. So the chief thought for a while, what, what do we do? What can we do? You know, they're going to overpower us. We're not known for our strength and fighting ability. 
So the chief said, let's cover it up. Everyone get some water. Let's turn the, the dirt into mud and let's just cover this statue in mud. So they covered the statue in mud. And by the time the opposing village had got there, they couldn't find the gold except this one ugly blob of mud in the middle of the village. And so the chief sent out a decree throughout the village that we will never uncover this statue because someone else will come and steal it. But as time went on, people in the village started to pass away until the last person that knew the truth about the statue died. The whole village had forgotten about the value of this statue until one day a little boy in the middle of the village went into town with his mum. And while his mum was trying to buy some bread, he picked up a stone and just started to throw stones as little boys do. And he started throwing stones at this big hunk of mud. And his mum said, stop that, stop that. And then she went back to the bakers and picked up another stone. And this time when the little boy threw the stone, he realised that some mud had fallen off the statue. And underneath there was something shiny. So he threw another stone and another stone. And at the end of the story, we find that as more and more gold became available, people in the town square, the village square, came and started to pull and take off the mud until they unveiled what they now knew was valuable gold. Here's the point of the story. I believe there are a lot of people listening to this message and at some point, whether it's been by your hand or someone else, you've got dressed in something that wasn't for you and it's covered up the value of what God's placed inside of you. Just like that statue. How, and, and, and you might say, hey, Ro, how do I... How do I uncover the value that's in me? Well, why don't you take some time and sit with God and just say, am I walking the way that I am? And if that's you this morning, I'm going to pray for you in a moment. But I believe that inside of every one of us, there's, there's gold. There is absolute gold. But life happens and isolation has come along and slowed us down a little bit. But the busyness and craziness and ugliness of life prior to that can add so much to our makeup and we end up wearing and walking in things that God never called us to. And my heart's plea this morning is that you would begin to get undressed. Just begin to get undressed. God, what do you want me to carry? God, what do you want me to step into? God, I trust you. Because remember, we started off with Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and I talked about my son Reuben. When people see Reuben, they see me. When people see us, my prayer is that they see God. Thank you for listening. It's been a privilege to come into your home this morning. Let me pray for you. Father, I just ask this morning that, that, that if there's anyone that would go through this process of just sitting down and just saying, God, what is it you want me to, to take off, to undress? God, that they would be faithful to do that. But Father God, I, I also pray that they would be faithful to say, Jesus, now you dress me. Father, I pray they would find freedom in that. They would find their value in being dressed by their Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, guys. Be blessed.
time. We are so blessed to have an amazing team behind the scenes bringing this all together and today we just want to give a special shout out to Nathan Burgess who has been editing all of our videos and just making them look incredible and as well on our website Nicole Stegman has been doing an awesome job as well. So thank you you guys and if you want to be part of our team then we encourage you to head to our website and let us know as well because there's so much happening behind the scenes that you don't even see but it's incredible to be part of that journey. Let me just pray for you, I'm press. Father, we thank you that not only are you moving in our lives, God, you are moving in the community as well. There are things happening, Father, and we put our trust in you. And we pray, God, that you would just begin to bless the families in the Wine Press community in a new and fresh way. We pray that you would bring a new opportunity to share your, our faith with the community around us. And we thank you, God, that you are still alive and moving with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, we have some discussion questions coming up now, and we really encourage you, don't tune out yet, but start discussing those questions with your family or your community group. It's amazing what God brings out of you from what you've learnt in the sermon once you start discussing these questions as well. So enjoy them. We'll see you next week.